let me first start off by describing the attacks that actually caused people to flee to these refugee camps. Everyone who's living here in these tents right now is from the Ruta Duma area, and that is where, of course, the, the alleged chemical strike took place. We've been spending the better part of the day with this family. This is uh, Um Nur, the two girls, the twins, and they have brought some of their stuff with them. The kids' bags still have a very acrid smell with them. And what Um Nur is going to show us here right now is what her daughter did when they were leaving. And as they were leaving, this is how traumatized children are. As they were leaving, she took her dolls and hid them inside this box and then told the doll, speaking to the doll, said, you're going to suffocate in here maybe, but at least you might be safe from the bombings. Now, we were talking to Um Umnur about those airstrikes that took place, those U.S., U.K., and French airstrikes that took place. And she was telling us that she does not want to see more civilian casualties. She does not want there to necessarily be a violent military end to all of this, but there has to be some sort of a political solution. This has to end. They were all underground when the regime, the alleged regime chemical attack took place. And she was telling us about how they were trying to come up when the bombing happened and she could barely breathe. She was trying to get up the stairs. She could, didn't feel, she, she felt that her entire nerves basically released. And they were trying to hold cold, wet pieces of cloth and they tried to go up to the upper levels and then and then when they reached the upper levels trying to escape this chemical strike there was an air strike that happened so they were forced back underground and this is just a smidgen of what it is that these families have all been going through and that is exactly why they don't want to just see limited airstrikes she wants to see a political solution but at the end of the day it's not just chemical attacks that are killing and destroying people's lives here it's all of the other bombings that are taking place Arwa, i know you're talking to that family specifically there where do these people want to go well, in an ideal world, you know, they would they would go back home. They would go back to the lives that they had before. But where can they actually realistically go? This is going to end up being their life for who knows exactly how long. No one can answer that. And what so many of these parents are so worried about is where are the children going to go to school? These two twins, they're seven years old. All they've known is war. They haven't had a chance to have a proper education. In fact, when they first came to this camp, their mother was telling us that they began, for the ants here, they began actually digging a little trench for the ants. That's how they were playing a game so that the ants could stay safe from potential bombing. And that is going to be the, the next big crisis that this region, this country, is going to have to deal with. There are so many people living in these refugee camps throughout this entire province, throughout Idlib province, that don't have the option of going back home because their homes have been completely destroyed. Talk to anybody here, and they will tell you that when you refer back to Ruta, to Duma, what happened to them there is beyond words. The nightmare that they've lived, the fact that there are no buildings standing, the fact that you can't even recognize streets that you used to have anymore. We were talking to an elderly lady who was here and she lost her son and three of her grandchildren. And she was telling us that the only thing she wishes she could have back is those moments when the entire family was all alive and still together and they were having their Friday lunches. And it is heartbreaking to be talking to these people. And when you ask them what their thoughts are about the reaction from the outside world, they feel as if they have repeatedly been betrayed. They feel as if these strikes are, are limited and that they're not really about trying to save them or trying to end the suffering of the Syrian population, that they're more just another move in this broader, global, sickening game of chess that's going on. And they truly feel as if there's no one standing by them and no one who really wants to protect them. And Arwa, quickly, uh, the numbers we discussed at the top of this, uh, this segment that previously uh, thousands of Syrians, uh, Syrian refugees were allowed to come here to the U.S. And in the first quarter thus far this year, just 11 
uh, Syrian refugees uh, let into this country. That's got to be heartbreaking for a lot of people who are hoping that this would be their refuge. Yeah, it would be if they were aware of those numbers, although, mm. frankly, I don't think many of them would actually be surprised by it. There has long, long been a sense amongst the Syrian refugee population, whether it's those who are internally displaced within their own country or those who are in neighboring countries trying to begin to build to build their lives, that the rest of the world doesn't care about them, that doors are being shut repeatedly in their face, whether it's Europe or the United States, they have long felt as if America actually isn't going to come to save them. And, and, and there is this, this complete and total sense of despair because fundamentally, many of them actually do want to believe that if America truly wanted to, it could save them. It could have ended all of this years ago. But there is that ongoing sense that everything is being shut in their faces that they have no other option, that they truly are being left to try to fend for themselves in some of the most inconceivable, inhumane circumstances. And that is incredibly difficult for anyone to go through, never mind for people who have already been through so much to have to begin to try to comprehend and understand. All right, all right, we saw a, a boy, I think, there uh, go by was he holding, what was he holding? Could you tell, was there a toy gun? Yeah, I think he had some, yeah, no, no, I think it was um, toy guns, but um, I had a toffer that came from here, he had a little bit of a gun. Come, come, here, he's right here. Hello, how are you? What's your name? Mohammed. Mohammed, what are you playing with the gun? His name is Mohammed. What are you playing with? Plastic. Plastic. Why are you playing with the gun? It's not enough for the war. I'm asking him why he's playing with guns. Hasn't he had enough of war? Why are you playing with him? Oh, you're playing with him? Yeah, he's playing with his friends. Why are you playing with him? What's the game? It's a game. It's a game. Yeah, he's playing war with guns. And I think, you know, that's... It's not a game for these children. For them, war is very, very very real but at the same time and this goes back to maybe your other question about where can they go you know um is saying right now if pe people have forgotten this concept of children's rights and when a child doesn't have an alternative reality an alternative narrative when they don't have an opportunity to go to school to go to learn when all they know is this violent way of life then what sort of chance do they have at a future what sort of chance do they actually have to, to integrate into society and, and to begin to believe that the world can actually be a better place than the one that they know. Oh, well, we see uh, just as much as your, your photographer can show us here with this camera angle, but how large, how expansive is this camp? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that question, please? How large is this camp? Um, there are probably a few thousand families here and this is just one of the camps that has been set up to try to uh, receive those who were forcibly evacuated from Ghutza and Duma. There is a second camp that is significantly larger than this one and if we were to somehow be able to drive through this entire countryside that we're in, in Aleppo and in Idlib, you actually just see camp after camp after camp. It's endless and that, again, goes back to this whole issue of what happens to these families, what happens to these children. The nightmare scenario is that these camps somehow become much more permanent, that this then becomes their reality, that then they are not able to go back home. They're not able to, to actually have a viable and real future in their own country. When you ask some of them why they stayed in these areas under siege for so long, some will tell you that it's because... When you've lost so much in your life, when you've lost so many people that you love, you somehow just want to cling to whatever it is that is remotely familiar, and that's why some of them don't leave. Others don't leave because they don't have the means or they have elderly living with them. And yes, a fair number of those families who are here are the families of people that were fighting against the regime. Every single person we've been talking to today has lost someone who they love. We have spoken to people who were impacted 
by the 2013 chemical bombing, who then were wounded in other bombings that happened afterwards, who then were affected by this most recent chemical bombing, and who then were wounded again afterwards before they were able to be evacuated. And I think the other most striking thing, though, is, and just to leave you with this thought, is that despite everything that these people have gone through, every family we spoke to then invited us to have tea hmm. because that is what this culture here is all about and that is the humanity that they are holding on to.